Tonight on Need to Know, a celebrated hero and humanitarian comes to Rochester with a message that inspires yet also stings. He's known for saving the lives of more than 1,200 people during one of the most catastrophic events in world history. What we all have to learn from the legacy of the Rwandan genocide 25 years later. And what a self-proclaimed ordinary man says we must do to stop it from happening again. Don't go anywhere. A special edition of Need to Know starts right now. Twenty-five years ago this month launched the beginning of 100 days of unimaginable terror. We've discussed the Rwandan genocide before on the program, and we do so again tonight. Why? Because one of the survivors and heroes of that genocide says, 25 years later, its legacy is a lesson that we, as a global society, have yet to learn. Monroe Community College recently invited Paul Rusesabagina to Rochester. His visit, organized by MCC's Holocaust, Genocide and Human Rights Project, was a call to action of sorts. Rusesabagina was a hotel manager in Rwanda at the time of the genocide. His hotel quickly became a place of refuge for those trying to escape the rampant violence. Rusesabagina used his charm and negotiation skills to protect the lives of more than 1,200 people seeking shelter at the hotel. His story may sound familiar to some of you. It inspired the Hollywood film Hotel Rwanda. Don Cheadle received an Oscar nomination for his role portraying Paul Rusesa Bagina. In his autobiography, An Ordinary Man, the celebrated hero and humanitarian says what he did 25 years ago was anything but extraordinary. He says it's what anybody should do to show love and value for humankind. I interviewed Rusesa Bagina during his visit to learn more about his story, why the horrific events of 1994 are still relevant today, and why the world can't turn a blind eye to humanitarian tragedies. Well, most of the time, we do not, we do not, we pretend not to learn, and yet I think we know. But we pretend not to know because we do never want to get involved. We always want to get away from what is happening so that nobody will ask us why. We, when we saw things happening, did not intervene and do something. Here I'll give you an example of the United Nations. The United Nations were in Rwanda in 1994. Since October 1993, the UN were there with 2,700 soldiers. But on day one of the genocide, we saw these United Nations running away, and turning the whole world, turning the backs, closing ears and eyes, because they don't want to see, they don't want to hear, they do not want to get involved. And I would ask you, lack of involvement, doesn't that in some way come back to haunt those who don't get involved? Uh, definitely. We always keep regretting, but regretting you, when you're regretting, is regretting. You can't change anything when you regret. Well, all the time, after the first world genocide, the second one, the third one, everything that has been happening, the international, this international community always comes in saying, we are sorry. Pretending we are sorry, we did not know. Didn't they know? That is a big question mark. Well, your story and the story what hap that happened at the hotel that you managed in Rwanda 25 years ago, that story still significantly impacts people today. Uh, it inspired the film, Hotel Rwanda. Uh, Don Cheadle, who portrayed you, was nominated for an Oscar for his role. But what 
I find interesting is that your book, your autobiography was titled An Ordinary Man. And throughout your book, you describe yourself as simply a hotel manager doing your job. And why is it important for you to explain your actions that save the lives of more than 1,200 people as simply ordinary? Ah, okay, that is a very exciting question. <laughs> uh, many people have kept asking me that question, and I do understand them. People, the reason why I'm at a biography is an ordinary man, because what I, what I did was rather what each and every human being should have done to a fellow human being. There was nothing extraordinary. Me, I was a hotel manager. I kept being a hotel manager from day one of, the, of my job and day one of the genocide up to the end of everything. I was always a hotel manager. I was never promoted to any other job. So that to me was rather ordinary the opposite to what many people wanted to call me, to tell me, oh, you did extraordinary things, you did this and that, that was not extraordinary. That was rather what I was supposed to do. That was rather what you also might be supposed to do if you are exposed to my situation. Is helping your neighbor, your, your neighbor extraordinary? Is protecting your Say your husband is there, you are, and someone comes and beats you. Will your husband keep silent? No. He's there to protect you. Your neighbor can also protect you, as you can also protect your neighbor. But is that extraordinary? That is rather ordinary. That is our mission. You wrote something that struck me, and this was in the introduction to your book, and you wrote this when describing the scene outside of your home on day one of a massacre that took nearly a million lives, and this is what you wrote. Watching this happen in my own neighborhood was like looking up at a blue summer sky and seeing it suddenly turning to purple. The entire world had gone mad around me. What had caused this to happen? Very simple words. Describe what you meant by that. How did words have that much power? Well, I think among the lessons I'll be so, so giving to students, no words one are one of the no most important lessons I have taken. ever learned. No one been taken out In Rwanda, before the, the revolution of 1959-60, we, because of words, we became enemies. Tutsis were telling Hutus that they are, they are subjects. A Hutu means someone who works for someone else, free of charge. So because of words, Hutus were humiliated by Tutsis, traditionally. It became a tradition. It has taken now more than 50 years from then to date, almost 60. With the words, immediately after the revolution, when Hutus took over the, the administration, the power from Tutsis, Tutsis started the struggle, trying a rebellion, trying to take over, to take back the power. They called themselves cockroaches because a cockroach runs very fast and very fast and hides so that you can't you can't catch it you can't get hold of it Hutus use this world this word to kind of dehumanize Tutsis those are always words coming then to 1994 in 1994 when I was using my words to save more than a thousand lives, there were many others who were using words at the radio, using words with words, asking their neighbors to kill neighbors. Killing had become a job because of words, because the radio was urging people to help 
them feel the graves. Help us to feel the graves. They are not yet full. They were telling the people to on the hills that you, you just, you, you look for those cockroaches. So where they were using words. And me, I was that time the opposite. I was using my words, negotiating, doing whatever I could do with words. So I have come to a conclusion that words can be the best weapons ever. And as they can be the worst weapons, depending on what you want one wants to achieve. You mentioned words, that that was one thing that enabled you to negotiate and to save lives. What else, you mentioned in your book you had strange advantages. What were some of the other strange advantages at your disposal that you were able to use? You see, sometimes we tend to say that people are bad. I do agree. People are bad. People can be bad. People can be criminals. I do agree with it. A hundred percent. But I have noticed that that is also an advantage. You, no one can be a hundred percent bad as no one can be a hundred percent good. Each and every heart, we say in Kinyarwanda, that that person has got a very hard heart. But I have noticed that no heart can be completely hard. Each and every heart has a small piece, however small it might be, but it, might, it has a soft piece of it. So it is us to dig into each and every human being, find that soft spot, and negotiate, deal with it, work on it. We will always end up getting what we want. I saw him now jumping out of his jeep, handing me over a gun, telling me that you, traitor, you are lucky. We are not killing you today. But take this gun. Kill all of your cockroaches in these cars. I, they know, be, try to be in my place, in my position that day. I just watched that young man. He was a young captain. I watched him almost sweating without anything to say. And after about four or five minutes, I opened up, the, watching him, him trying to get away from my sight, trying to see, you know, to look the other side. I noticed that there was a room for negotiations. And I told him that, sir, me, I don't know how to use guns. And that time I was very sincere. I had never, ever taken a gun in my hands, ever. I had seen guns as you see them, but I had never, ever touched a gun. So I told him that, my friend, I don't know how to use guns. But even if I knew, I don't see any good reason why I should kill. I should kill this old man. Sometimes, if you have to deal with such, such situations, you have to even agree, if you really don't agree, <laughs> but it helps. So I told him that, my friend, I do understand you. I did not really understand how a human being can be that wild, but that was a way of saying, so I told him that if you guys are hungry, I do understand you. 
you are thirsty. I do understand you. You are stressed by this war. I do understand you. Would I have been in your position, I wouldn't have done it differently. But we can find other solutions. And there are always other solutions. So we negotiated. And after two long hours, we came up with an agreement. They drove us to the hotel. And then I went to my hotel, my, to my office, the hotel said, got cash, paid them. But I had learned, that is when I learned how to deal with the evil. I had come in a face-to-face -face situation with the evil. We dealt, we negotiated, and we came up with an agreement. After 76 nights uh, in the hotel, you were finally able to escape through an evacuation convoy. And uh, you were taken to a Tutsi rebel camp, and you later sought asylum in Belgium. After all that you had seen and experienced, what was the process even like for you and your family to develop some sort of normalcy in your life? Even when we were evacuated, we were very, very much, very much concerned about what happened. Because when we were taken to that camp, some of my hotel employees who were not there when people were being butchered, who were just in the hotel, were taken by the newcomers, the winners, and also killed. Some of my refugees were killed as well. So I couldn't understand what was going on. Were we going through something good? No, life was not easy. It was so complicated. And we kept living that kind of life to, we, we were seeing people being tortured, tied from the back, already from there, tied from the back, their chests beaten, thrown into containers, just uh, rotting there. And after many hours, they were dead. They were taking their bodies, going to burn them, and then to burn them in the national park. So it was horrible. That never, mass, what are mass massacres never ended. After what we called, the genocide. So that was still going on until a time when the, the then Rwandan army with the Ugandan army decided to attack the Congo. That much you know as much as I, I do, even if you have never been there. And they killed, according to the UN mapping report on the Congo, they have the, today's Rwandan army, the newcomers, the Tutsi army, has killed in the Congo, that during that period between 1996 and 2000, they killed 300,000 lives on our own watch. And nobody says nothing. Until a time I was almost assassinated myself. And I had, having no choice, I had to go, very, as once again, very sad, very bitter, to forget everything I had worked for throughout my whole life. I just went, as you see me, with my three elder children, and my wife followed, sometimes later, with the youngest ones. But you t when you go to, when you went to exile, why did I go to exile? There was no good reason. So I was still bitter. Paul, you mentioned this just now. You mentioned this earlier when we were talking about history repeating itself and how the world uh, essentially turned a blind eye to what was taking place um, in Rwanda. Considering the international human rights crises that we're dealing with in our world today, based on that and what you've experienced, what is your message to international communities in terms of doing something? The international community disappointed me. With many Rwandans, as we are disappointed. As I told you in 1993, October 20th, somewhere around there, the UN sent us 2,700 soldiers. But on day one of the genocide, when the then Rwandan army killed 10 UN Belgian UN soldiers, 
Immediately that morning, Belgium decided to pull out. And when Belgium decided to pull out, they, what I, they, they pulled out more than 300 soldiers, about 350. And backed by the United States, the United Kingdom, the whole world decided to abandon a whole nation to thieves and thugs and gangsters. The, or the whole world, the United Nations, decided to pull out. 2,000, about 2,500 soldiers were pulled out. Can you imagine, have, uh, try to, 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 to explain to me how a soldier with a gun who has come to defend, defense, what I, the people who have got no force, no, 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 no other force to fight. Those soldiers come and they just, they are the ones, number ones, to be evacuated. Can you imagine that? Can you explain that to me? That day, the UN decided to pull out and leave us with 260 soldiers. From 2700 to 260, the UN's mission is not to save lives, is not to, not, 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 it is just to come watch. They are not peacemakers, they are not peacekeepers, they are just observers. In what ways can everyday people who are watching this find ways to help bridge these gaps um, that we have right now, whether it's racial tension, um, religious tension, whatever the case may be, in ordinary ways? My wish would be, would be to see young people like students, in terms of thousands, why not millions, drafting letters to the United Nations, asking them to completely change the message, what are their mission. Because their mission, as it is today, is useless. So it has to be meaningful. They pretend to have soldiers in many different parts of the world, but those soldiers are not are doing nothing. So they have to change, to completely change the mission, make it a meaningful mission. And what, why not? If it needs be, why can't we go to New York and demonstrate? Tell them that they are doing nothing. They pretend they are cheating us, telling, telling us that they are doing something, and yet the results of what they are doing, zero. That was Paul Rusesa Bagina, a Rwandan genocide survivor and humanitarian. He told me he's in the process of working on his new book titled, Does Never Again Mean Never Again? He explains that after the Holocaust, the world said it would never again allow such horrific events to unfold. And yet, he says it did. His new book is a challenge to himself and all of us to consider the role we play in protecting the lives of others, regardless of race, religion, and background. And that wraps up a special edition of Need to Know, Rochester's news magazine. I'm your host, Helen B. and Duty Hofer. Thank you for joining me tonight, and have a great night.